Sure. Okay. So uh, another thing I would like us to like quickly go on to is the the, the part that has to do with uh, customer retention tactics. So uh, in um, the early days of my you know career as an entrepreneur, I I, I ran a, a co-working space business in in in, in a small city in okay, not a small city, big city. So it was a big city in uh, you know in a quite state. All right. So. Um, one of the things that I discovered was that it was very easy to get. Uh, okay, no, it was not so easy, right? But uh, when you're comparing uh, getting uh, a new customer to retaining the old customers, I discovered that it's actually more difficult to get, uh, you know, a new customer, but easier to retain them. But personally, from the perspective of uh, of my, uh, um, let's say my knowledge, then right. So I was. I was more interested in in getting new customers. I wasn't really paying attention to retaining the existing customers. Maybe bringing some amazing services and bonus to you know to make them like very excited about the whole thing. So uh, I discovered that sometimes I I I I, I, I lost most of my customers. So. Um, I would like you to talk about, uh, you know, some customer retention tactics that small and mid-sized business owners can, you know, uh, can leverage on to, you know, grow their customer and user base so that they don't get to spend so much money uh, in always trying to chase new customers, but rather just find ways to actually maintain the existing customers. Hmm. Uh, first and foremost, you're not alone <clears throat> in that you've kind of emphasized uh, acquisition or getting new customers versus retention or keeping customers that you have. In fact, if you were to look on Amazon or if you were to look on any of the large booksellers online, you'll find that books on customer acquisition sales, uh, like some marketing and sales books, for example, will outnumber any books that have any semblance of customer retention attached to them, whether it's customer service, retention, churn reduction, customer satisfaction the acquisition books outnumber the retention books 43 to 1 43 to 1 and that's not because the authors are more interested in it it's because most people are more interested in buying them right there's a psychological phenomenon that occurs and makes us feel as though growth comes from bringing in new customers and while that is part of the process it's far more expensive, it's far more labor intensive, and it will not lead to growth if, for example, you are churning out 20, 25, 30% of your customers or more every 90 days or every year or whatever, whatever it is. The best companies in the world, the top 1% of companies in the world are the ones that have top level retention and engagement. So an example of this kind of valuationally, let's say, for example, uh, we look at social networking, right? Um, Snapchat and Twitter, both of them have 33% retention, 33%. And they're both big companies. Snapchat has a $17 billion market cap. Twitter has a uh, $33 billion market cap pre-Elon, right? Um, Facebook, on the other hand, has a 92% retention rate versus the 33 from Twitter and Snapchat. Facebook, in contrast, has a $523 billion market cap. It's actually, you know, that was a, an old statistic. I'm not sure what it is today, but at the time that I collected that data, it was a $523 billion market cap, more than 10 times either of those by far. I mean, more than 20 times what Snapchat was. Um, other companies like, um, you know, uh, B2C subscription companies, Blue Apron, Dollar Shave Club, et cetera, right? Uh, Blue Apron, 33% retention, $175 million market cap. Dollar Shave Club, 40% retention, $1 billion market cap. Stitch Fix, 80% retention, $2.5 billion market cap, right? You could go through every industry like this. The companies that are the most valuable companies in the world are the ones that keep their customers, the customers that they acquire, they continue to pay. That's a mathematical exercise, right? It's, it is not a decision that anyone makes or no arbitrary decisions on who is deciding these. It comes down to how much money these customers are paying, right? If you acquire a customer and they st and you're charging them $100 a month and they stick around for six months, $600, right? But if you can do some things to make them more satisfied, 
and that customer stays around for 18 months or three years or more, uh, that same customer acquisition cost generated you so much more ROI and it took far less effort to make that happen. So really, before you're ready to grow, especially before you're ready to introduce any viral loops, which we may talk about later if we have more time, um, ensuring that you have a great customer experience after the customer is acquired is absolutely critical to that company's health. Now, retention metrics are a little bit different from company to company. These all kind of, kind of come down to the natural usage frequency of each product. There are some products that you may use once a day, once a week, once a month, once a year, once every 10 years, right? If you're buying a home or buying a car, it might be several years between purchases. If you're checking your email, it might be every couple hours. So retention rates are going to be different based on the type of product. The difference there is if you have a product that only has renewal or, or uh, repurchases every few years, you're going to find that you have to reacquire that customer basically every single time. So it may, it's almost like they aren't a recurring customer to begin with, which becomes very expensive and it becomes very difficult to scale. Um, what a lot of those companies will do is they'll add additional products that have a higher usage frequency so they can remain top of mind for that customer. So for example, if you look at Zillow in the US, that's a, a home sales marketplace. And you may only buy a new home every several years, right? Um, you know, if that, there are some people that stay in the same home for decades. Well, they also have a couple other products that are used once or twice a month, once or twice a week. And it's the same brand, it's the same product, it's the same platform, but you're engaging the user more often. And why is that? So the, the question becomes, how do you optimize for retention? Retention is what's called a lagging indicator, which means you don't know if it occurred until after all the activities took place to lead to a retained customer. What leads to a retained customer? Most people will say things like, oh, they have a great customer experience, also a lagging indicator, right? So you can't necessarily plan for that. You can plan activities that lead to that. What you can also start to look at are things like the frequency of customer complaints. Uh, you can also look at engagement within a product. How often is that, is that customer using the product combined with how often when they use the product, are they getting the intended core value of that product? Uh, so those two data points when combined the volume of customer complaints versus the engagement of the user um, really give you clues on how well you're satisfying that customer in relation to the core value they came to you to achieve. And the higher the frequency of engagement and the lower the frequency of customer complaints, usually that's the higher the retention rate. There are two types of retention rates. Uh, there's, you know, voluntary and involuntary, right? So for example, and, and the inverse of retention is churn. So if we talk about churn, when customers leave, sometimes customers are leaving for no, no decision of their own. Uh, it's because they ran out of money or their business failed or something along those lines and they can no longer pay you, although you gave them the fantastic experience they were expecting. That's great. And that's a different problem than voluntary churn, which is a customer is able to pay they're willing to pay, but they're not getting what they need from you. And they decide on their own to leave. Maybe it's for an alternative, maybe it's for a competitor. Um, those two things are solved in different ways. The latter, voluntary churn, is where most people focus because it's more within their control, or at least that's what their mind tells them. Involuntary churn, though, is also in, in your control. It's a targeting issue. So, uh, when you're acquiring customers, for example, this is where you can solve for involuntary churn. And you, you solve that problem by ensuring that uh, you're marketing to stable customers that are in stable situations. Does that mean that if a customer who has an unstable business comes to you and wants to buy, you don't sell to them? No, you, you can, but you need to make sure that you're not spending money acquiring those customers and you're not you know, projecting that you'll keep that customer for uh, all that long, right? Um, so 
through that lens, the one thing that I always tell people when they're starting a business is don't market to broke people, right? There's nothing against people who are, who are, who don't have very much money, but you can't build a business that way because they won't be able to pay you regardless of how awesome your product is. They don't have the money to pay you physically. Now let's say you have an ad driven model and you're showing those people ads. Maybe that lasts a little bit longer, but your advertisers are only going to stay with you for as long as those ads are generating revenue for them because they're wanting those people that you're, market, that you're showing ads to, to buy from them. If they're not getting an ROI, return on investment from that transaction, they're going to stop advertising for you. So both of those models fail if your customers don't have any money to pay either you or your advertisers. So the targeting issue then becomes really critical if you have high involuntary churn, making sure that those customers are actually able and willing to pay, right? So, so willing to pay is voluntary, involuntary is able to pay, right? So if we go to voluntary churn, that's when we can go into things like ensuring people are engaged, ensuring people have customer experiences that are stellar, uh, ensuring that your support quality is high and there are a tremendous amount of uh, resources that can lead to uh, improving engagement. Um, you can basically lead people through their onboarding process in your product really, really carefully to ensure that you can reverse engineer engagement from your most engaged customers. Really relies on the fact that you know you're collecting a lot of data on these customers as they go through uh, your process. Uh, but by and large, the one thing that I would want you to take away from this particular topic is the fact that retention is the foundation upon which all growth is built. It's not talked about nearly as much. Again, going back to that statistic, 43 to 1 versus customer acquisition topics in book sales. I would wager that there it's even a worse ratio if you look at articles or videos or social media content. And it's because most people who haven't done the homework and haven't done the math, you know, believe that that's what they're missing. They need new customers. And that's a new business thing, right? You need, you need new customers for a new business. And most businesses are new because most businesses fail. Um, but in order to actually have a viable business, you have to keep the customers you have. So the one thing I would say, if you take anything away from this section, is early on in your process, if you say, you know, maybe you have a new marketing agency or something along those lines, if your first level of scale is to get 10 clients, right? No matter how you get them, you get them however you want, tap your network, knock on doors, you know, ask anyone you know for referrals, whatever it takes to get those 10 customers. Your next level of scale is to show them the absolute best possible experience you can in order to get at least 50% of them to give you a video testimonial. And that then is your signifier that you've actually done a good job uh, in servicing that customer and you've given them a great user experience, especially if the vast majority of them retain voluntarily. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It makes a whole lot of sense. It makes a whole lot of sense.